Hey, George. John. George Johnson. Good to talk to you. <laughs> John Morgan, it's been a while. Oh man, it's uh, yeah, it's been too long. It feels like forever. Um, I know. But uh, you know what? The dozens of fans of the George and John show out there have been clamoring for our return. And so uh, here we really? are back on Blogging Heads TV. <laughs> all, all one dozen? <laughs> I said dozens, George. Dozens? Wow, does this come from from, from Blogging Head to uh, Home Office in Terre Haute, Indiana? <laughs> that's just my seat of the pants uh, guesstimate. Based oh, on, that's uh, good. That's good. I, I have gotten a, gotten a few nice emails from people that, uh, that seem to miss this. Yeah, me too. Um, that's, that's nice. Yeah, it made me feel good. But they've got this new system. You know, I did one of these with Bob, and it was with uh, Skype. And because I did it with Bob, I had all the tech support I needed. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I just felt a little bit of inertia when it came to trying to do one of these on my own with you. And, of course, yeah. you know, there's all this other shit going on. It's this new regime um, <laughs> that uh, Blogging Heads is under, so... Yeah, and now we're back to the old-fashioned technology. Maybe we should explain for, for people that the way blogging heads traditionally is done, we can't see each other. Yeah. So we have video cameras pointing at ourselves, and we can see how we look if we want to look at the screen. And then we talk, and we're actually talking by an old-fashioned landline. P-O-T-S, plain old telephone service, and then we're recording this locally, audio and video, on our computers, and then we actually upload it to Blogging Head Central by FTP. You know, this is all just uh, Model T kind of Internet stuff. And then skilled technicians at Blogging Head Central splice it together into, um, into these odd conversations that show what people look like when they can't see each other. Right. And I guess under the new, the new, the new, the new Bobware, uh, it uses Skype, and you're actually recording and seeing each other in real time and all of that. Yeah, and you know, I gotta say, I wasn't better? crazy about it. I found it distracting to see Bob's face there, and it's not just <laughs> that he's rolling his eyes and uh, right. giving me all this kind of uh, face language in response to what I'm saying. It was just kind of weird. I'm, I was so used to this old system and, um, you know, just seeing my face there. Yeah, uh, it's kind of fun. Then later, if you can bear to watch it, then you can see the other person reacting. You know, they might be making faces and rolling their eyes and uh, and uh, who knows what else. But, uh, yeah, I kind of like the like the funky, funky quality of that, but... Me too. But um, yeah, I'm glad they're I'm glad they're letting us do it because I'm not comfortable with the new new one. And I yeah, there's a question over whether my DSL line will support enough bandwidth to give the high fidelity quality that Blogging Heads TV watchers are accustomed to. <laughs> well, you know, I must say, George, I don't know about you, but I have not been standing in digital place since we last spoke. So. Uh, I now, I'm, so I'm, this conversation now is taking place on my old Hewlett Packard PC that was issued to me by, by Stevens. It completely crashed uh, wow. last fall, but I got the whole thing refurbished. But in the meantime, I got myself a new MacBook Air, which I have open right here on my side. So um, as you have always done in the past, now <laughs> I can web surf. While, oh, while you're talking, so we can yeah find things and yeah yeah I just all do this with one computer with with two screens and then um, and, um, and you know they, you know, they always we're world. always told that we can't have any other programs open when we record because it ruins it but I haven't found that it really makes any difference so. until it does George yeah until fingers crossed we have, we have had some disasters it's true <laughs> yeah hey listen I want to tell you about two other things that I'm doing just to make me even more wired and connected than I was before. Um, yeah. I'm holding now up, I finally got a Kindle, and uh, I got the cheapest Kindle. 79 bucks for this little device, and yeah. uh, I just got this for myself before I went to England with my kids at the end of June, and um, I immediately downloaded 
uh, a bunch of free fiction onto it, the collected works of Edgar Allan Poe, oh. and um, and also the collected works of, works of H.P. Lovecraft. And oh, I, wow, the old horror writer. Yeah, I've really gotten into him. Um, and it oh. turns out that he is undergoing kind of a cult revival now. Really? So, so I was... Uh, you know, I was telling my son Mac that I was, I was, I think we were on the airplane, and I was, I was reading, and I said to him, you know, you ever heard of this guy H.P. Lovecraft? And he goes, Cthulhu. And I said, what? And he said, <laughs> Cthulhu. That's where that came from, H.P. Lovecraft, the cult of Cthulhu. So I said, what the hell are you talking about? He goes, look it up, look up the story, Cthulhu. So I, I looked in the table of contents and. Um, Sure enough, there's a story. It's actually called, let's see, The Call of Cthulhu. And, yeah, um, okay. It's just the weirdest story. It's about this place in New England that is suddenly um, haunted and then uh, destroyed by this gigantic invisible monster. It's, it's like this mountain and and uh, at the very end, these people catch a glimpse of it because they sprinkle some kind of powder over it. And it turns out to have some kind of gigantic octopus head. It's yeah. really, really gruesome. And apparently, <laughs> there are people now who, who worship this thing. You can go onto the Internet and find, uh, find uh, websites devoted to this guy, uh, Cthulhu. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, if, if nothing else, the internet is good at uh, reviving, reviving old cult figures and turning them into new ones like Lovecraft. Listen, I, I gotta, I, at the risk of immediately boring people before we uh, even start, and including you, I have to. Oh, read there's this, nothing wrong with that. I have to read this little passage. Okay. There's, he's got some shit that is just so cool, especially. This is, this is Lovecraft. Yeah, this is Lovecraft, and this is from the Call of Cthulhu. Um, and uh, it's um, what, I, what I love about him is usually, you know, if he's got monsters, it's like the old problem with monsters. Once he starts to really show you the monster, it just seems kind of silly and dumb. Um, yeah. But when he's just building the air of uh, mystery and suspense, it's really creepy in a cool way. And mm. um, it's all this kind of uh, pseudo scientific mumbo jumbo, too, which I love. So yeah. here's from. The introduction to Cthulhu, and this is relevant to some of the science stories that we're going to be talking about. We huh. live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our own frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Wow. Cool, huh? That's beautiful. Yeah, I think, and I and very prescient, I think. When was this written, more or less? This was uh, written exactly in 1921. 21. Wow. So he was anticipating uh, one of the theories of the Higgs boson. <laughs> I'm sorry, 1926 it was published. 1926. Okay. God, 1926. Yes. That was like, uh, for that, that year always sticks in my mind because one of the really old radios in my antique radio collection was made in 1926, and it's a battery-operated opera, battery vacuum tube receiver, and it was one of the first broadcast receivers ever made. So this was about the time when the first broadcast radio was coming, you know, commercial broadcast radio. You know, there was Marconi and experimental and military stuff before that. But, you know, actual shows, and, uh -huh. and then from there it was TV and, and then the Internet, and, and there was Lovecraft. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's sort of, um, it, it's very kind of weirdly pre-modern and still, I mean, listen, this is before anybody knew about nuclear weapons, but there was yes, all this. Yes, this is pre-nuclear weapons, right. Yeah. 
but there's still and a it's lot before of threat. all the you know all, all of you know there's that lawsuit trying to stop CERN because one of the high energy experiments at the particle accelerator you know one, one of their aims is to try to create these hypothetical mini black holes and they thought this would swallow the universe and and that also came up at um, at uh, out in Long Island at uh, Brookhaven so mm -hmm. so that's the sort of thing he was talking about if, yeah. except it didn't happen and who knows but, but it might have happened though I mean they, so you know the, the reason I mentioned you know other than a real clumsy transition that, that, that this was like very prescient as to the Higgs you know there was that one there was a really weird paper that came out a few years ago that I think uh, I think I'm sure it was Dennis Overby brought it to the to the attention of uh, of the masses where these two scientists these theorists were saying that the reason that they hadn't found the Higgs and that the reason that the uh, LHC the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva uh, was having all these troubles, you know, with melting magnets and all these malfunctions and delays. And the reason was because the Higgs was this particle of such a nature that, uh, one, if it was created, it would basically destroy the universe. And two, the particle was able to uh, ripple, cause some ripple in the time fields and go back to the past and therefore prevent any attempts uh, to actually find it. Because you know, by by torquing, so, so so the so so the article so the particle basically was so destructive and so abhorrent for whatever reason it was so abhorrent that uh, part of its mechanism was to prevent itself from ever being found by reaching back into the past and doing a uh, you know the equivalent of killing your own grandfather so you won't be born sort of thing. And it was trying to protect us from our own I guess, power yeah, and knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'll admit that I didn't didn't you know get into. I only read the uh, kind of a rough description of the paper, but I think uh, I think Dennis's take was that you know, this is re really shows that they've got to get the got to get the LHC up and running because these people have so much time in their hands that it's really <laughs> getting pathological. But uh, but uh, so so. Um, yeah, yeah, and then he, and then I was reminded because Dennis pointed out in, in a uh, blog post yesterday or today, in addition to his piece in the Times, that uh, that well, if one thing, this would disprove the theory that the Higgs can't be discovered because it would go back in time and prevent it from being discovered. But of course, you know, there's, it's still not a, not a hundred percent certain, or as close to a hundred percent as. You know, it might be. So it's still it's still a semi-tentative discovery. So maybe all this other stuff's now going to arise, and and it's, so it's still possible that the Higgs, you know, was discovered in the future or created in a blast, and then it rip, it's rippling back and preventing us from finding it now. Still, so it that sounds, sounds more Lovecraftian than than science. And it's I would call it Johnson-esque as well, because <laughs> all we have is this nebula of possibilities and we're projecting our own desires on it and and finding possibly what we want to find well yeah seeing the yeah yeah looking for patterns and seeing the shadows of our own brains yeah that was my my old metaphor from from long ago but uh that's right because this is just the higgs like particle i mean it's the higgs like or particle what? still it's, it's like it's like uh, you know a, a movie that. Uh, in fact, this is true of Prometheus, this big blockbuster. It's like a prequel to uh, the Alien series that I saw recently. And it, oh yeah. And, you know, it's this big cool movie with really crazy aliens and and uh, groovy special effects, this fantastical uh, landscape and another galaxy or star system or whatever. Uh, but then it ends really weakly, obviously, just sort of punting to the next movie and yeah. and promising that we will get some kind of plot resolution um, ah. then and I feel like with the Higgs boson it's also they're setting us up for another discovery of the Higgs boson six months or a year from now <laughs> <laughs> well it's not not, not clinched yet but uh, yeah what are, yeah I mean they're basically what well, there was that line that the guy the Director General of CERN said at a press conference, like in lay language, I think we got it, and then everyone, one applauded. But um, 
I guess the catch is that they have to show that this has the predicted characteristics of the HIG that's predicted by the standard model, you know, that it's spin zero uh, and is indeed a, indeed a um, boson and that it's, uh, you know, because it's spin zero and, and um, other aspects that were predicted. And I, I mean, it's, it's, it's within the range of mass that's, uh, that's plausible and that's ruled out by other, you know, you know, it's, it's within this narrowing window of mass, it seems likely, and, but then there's these other characteristics, I guess, before they can really nail it. Plus, even though it's, you know, what do they call it, five sigma, which means one in, I don't know, how many million chance that it's uh, just a statistical fluke. So yeah. that's considered really, you know, really, really good odds that it's not, but it's still possible that they would run the, the experiment however many million times again and not find it and that it is a statistical fluke. You know, it's one of those things where ultimately you settle for this very, very high, high probability. But it was fascinating to read about. You know, so basically they can't detect the Higgs directly. They can, their theory tells them that the Higgs will break down into certain particles. Mm -hmm. You know, and this going from the Higgs to these daughter particles, each, each different way it might do that is called a channel. So there's more than one channels through which the Higgs decay. So they find decay particles in a pattern, you know, type of particles, energies, etc., that is one of the channels that the Higgs can decay into, but then other things can decay into that channel too, and all with you know various probabilities and and uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just listen, George, are you Still turned on by this kind of stuff? Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I the, the thing that really got me. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I've been sort of blanking it out the last you know year or so. I've just been superficially following the stories because I figure, well, they're going to keep saying they almost get it. But this one, you know, become you know comes close enough that I started tuning in again and going back and reminding myself of all the. The hand-waving popular science explanations of the Higgs that we've all indulged in over the years, you know, how it's, how it's the Higgs field and it's like a bunch of molasses and the particles get their mass from the Higgs because, you know, the electron is 1,700 times less massive than the proton. So the, the electron can move through the molasses more easier than the proton. And this explains why the particles have their different masses. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it doesn't because it's just a completely circular story because, you know, well, you know, why does the proton move through it more slowly? And, you know, and then when you get into the theory, you know, the, the field theory, apparently this stuff all becomes clear, but then we're sort of left as people who have to translate this into words to come up with these very imprecise metaphors so that you sort of get the illusion of understanding. Yeah, I, and, well, I, I don't know what, you know, uh, I, I'm sure I've told you before, one of the reasons I wanted to become a science writer was because I was so turned on by, by uh, the popular books about physics in the late 70s. And, yeah, oh, it's wonderful and, uh, books. Early 80s, even some that seem very flaky in uh, retrospect, like the uh, the Tao of physics and so forth. Um, but uh, I remember also just reading *Brief History of Time*. This is after I became a science writer, but really yeah. being turned on by you know the whole quest for a unified theory that could oh yeah that could wrap up all the forces of nature in one tidy package. So. Just as a little background to, to what the Higgs is about, it's it's a really it's a really big missing piece of what's called the standard model of particle physics, right. which explains um, electromagnetism and the weak force, which now we know are are two aspects of one uh, unified force called the electroweak force and uh, the strong nuclear force. Which uh, is mediated by these uh, these particles called uh, quarks. So this ex explains yeah. the micro realm. Quarks and gluons. Yeah, and um, and it's ex and it accounts for um, basically all of nature except for gravity, which is right. a really right. big part of nature. And gravity yeah. is described, of course, by general relativity. And and as most of our listeners know, um, you, you know you've got these two different theories that are 
completely, they're, they're like in these uh, languages that can't be translated into each other, and it's, it's been very frustrating for scientists. Yeah, and the mathematics is immiscible. Yeah. Like oil and water. And so, um, you know, going back, actually all the way back to Faraday. Faraday even, because he was the person who saw that uh, electricity and magnetism were really two aspects right. of one force. And he envisioned this day when you'd have a single theory that also embraced gravity. It was really this amazing. Yeah, he actually tried to he actually tried to unify electromagnetism and gravity, and he did experiments and things like with you know where, where you would try to get magnets, you know, magnetic forces to influence uh, gravitational forces, and and he really? couldn't detect any effects. And, That's yeah. very cool. I didn't know that. I thought he just yeah, purely it's really, speculated. Yeah, I, I, I forget the details. I, I, I did a chapter on Faraday and 10 Most Beautiful Experiments, and then toward the end I showed how he, uh, he you know, this led him to want to, you, you know, he really got into the whole spirit of unification that became the intellectual adventure of the 20 and 21st century so far. And, yeah, well, that's well, really exciting stuff, you know. And I remember reading, you, you know, you know that great book by Bob, Bob Kreese and, and, and uh, Charles Mann, Robert Kreese and Charles Mann. It's called the Second Creation. Yes, and it's like this wonderful history of um, of the whole unification drive. And I remember reading that and just be, you know, blown away just first by the exci the intellectual excitement, and also just by the artfulness in which they they um, explain the science and. And and not you know not in, you know it's it's definitely written at a more level of detail than a lot of these things are. But I was actually just going back to that this morning and trying to remind myself of what they'd written about the Higgs and trying to find some new way to explain it, except for the molasses thing or the the thing of the the paparazzi floating around the most famous, hovering around the most famous people at the party, and, this, mm -hmm. and the paparazzi is like uh, the Higgs boson giving them mass, and just, oh, God, all of this stuff. And, and then you start thinking, like, well, mass, you know, so, but electrons and protons, okay, protons 1,700 times heavier than the electron, but both the proton and the electron are point particles, they have no dimension, so it's like mass isn't really the stuff that's inside the particle in a way that there's mass inside, you know, a rock, it seems like, and it's more like the mass is a network principle or a system principle of these particles interacting with other particles through a field. Mm -hmm. And That's so, nice and then of course, course of course, the mass is contained in the energy too by E equals mc squared. It just makes these things always make me realize when I start drilling down and thinking, you know, how to explain this with metaphors. There's a certain level that you just kind of have to stop, and, and you get into the hand waving and and the illusion of understanding. And, and that but, is even more true of, uh, and we've talked about this before, of, um, of uh, some of the entities postulated by uh, unified theories, especially by strings and membranes and things like that. I think yeah. you and I have talked about the fact that, um, that physicists, oh, yeah. have, at least in my case, have warned me that you can't think about, for example, a superstring as a thing, as, yeah, a, not as really. like a little yeah. particle. If you had a powerful enough microscope, it's something that you could look at, which actually, to a certain extent, is still true even of, um, uh, certainly of electrons and protons and things like that, and even to a certain yeah. extent of, uh, of quarks, although then it's all getting more uh, metaphysical. But then when you get down to the yeah. level of strings, you're talking about concepts that are even more fundamental than, as I understand it, matter and energy and space and time. And the only way yeah. to understand them is purely in terms of their mathematics, which yeah. are accessible only to a very few people. So, so, so it's not like if we had a really super microscope and kept drilling down, 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 we'd start seeing, you know, you know, core, I mean... Um, uh, strings and brains, and of course they're interesting because they have dimensional extent, unlike the particles and field theory. But yeah, you couldn't see them. But yeah, that even goes to—I mean, it's all 
you know, so much embedded in the mathematics. I mean, you know, the difference between a proton and a neutron, they have almost exactly the same mass, mm -hmm. but not quite. Another one of those weird, weird uglinesses that the Higgs is hopefully will help um, explain. And, and one of them, of course, has neutral charge, the neutron, and the proton has positive charge, almost but not exactly the same mass. And, and, and the model that accounts for this is called isospin, where, where you, have something, you have a nucleon, which is a proton or a neutron, depending on which direction, quote-unquote, it's spinning, quote-unquote, in this hypothetical field called uh, isospace or isospin space. And it's not like you can walk around inside isospin space like you can walk around inside an electromagnetic field that you you know, might create with, uh, you know, or an electrostatic field. Um, so it's much more, much more abstract and mathematical. And, yeah. um, well, remember, yeah. this, these, are all, these are all quantum phenomena, so... Um, yeah, and, and th yeah, yeah not, not to speak of that. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, so that, you know, by, sort of by definition, they, they don't really make any sense in terms of, uh, uh, of um, concepts that we're familiar with in, in this world that, that we live in, where, you know, yeah. there, are, there are objects that, that can be pushed and pulled by various... Uh, uh, forces and remember the mathematics themselves that describe quantum phenomena. You've got imaginary numbers, you know, the numbers based on right. on uh, the square root of negative numbers. I mean, what the fuck is that? It yeah, does, which is another way of sense. having a rotation and uh, a rotation and and um, yeah, and it's and, and then again, you know, I mean, why should the stuff down on this basic level be? You know, just like the marbles and rocks and things that we have up at this crude macro level. So it's just always just kind of coming up with some, yeah, and then no matter how weird it is, if it, if it can be used to make predictions, measurable predictions, you know, then that kind of shows you you're on the right track. And listen, this George, is at least one way to do it. Let's, you know, I, I, I want to point out that I think there is a temptation for, I don't know, postmodern philosophers who are, look skeptically, critically at science to think that there is, uh, there is an awful lot of projection going on with, uh, with the detection of something like um, the Higgs. But uh, as we've discussed before, there are some, there are some predicted entities that, that popped very naturally out of uh, particle physics theories that never were found. In spite yeah. of um, in spite of lots of effort to find that's, that's them. right. Like, yeah, not, it's not like everything that they. Yeah, that's true. That's like, true. Like, like there's a, what's the great example? Now, a magnetic monopole is one example. Magnetic so monopoles, right? Instead of being a sort of a conventional uh, little mini magnet with a negative and uh, positive pole, it's only got a single pole, which again doesn't really make any sense in terms of of how we understand yeah. magnets in the the macro world, but also there was supposed to be some kind of mini force or mediating particle that would be responsible for the decay of protons, which oh, was a, right, a right, really right. big deal back in the 70s. And um, that just, and, and there were all these kind of unified theories, um, unified theories that would uh, include um, the strong nuclear force plus the electro weak force. That's called oh, the, yeah, like the supersymmetry forces and the yeah. technicolor forces and and yeah, no, you're right because I mean you could say that well, you know, the theorists come up with these completely abstract things that only exist in the mathematics. They do these experiments and then they interpret the experiments in, in, in such a way, no matter how much convolution and, and ancillary hypotheses are required, and they can come up with something then that, that shows that this, this instantaneously disappearing event in a particle accelerator was indeed this predicted particle. But yeah, you're right that all these things that have been predicted, you know, a lot of them haven't been found. So right. it's obviously, yeah, so, no, so that's not a, yeah, it's not a fair thing. It's much more constrained constrained than that. It's just, you know, but it's very, it's just very spooky to think about, you know, this underlying reality that, you know, we can just, you know, like 
there's no, you know, the point we've made before, there's no reason why our brain should have evolved to be able to intuit this stuff. And the fact that we can do it mathematically, you know, which begs the whole question of, you know, what is this mathematics and where does it come from? And Yeah, big years old question. Um, the unreasonable effectiveness of... Uh, Mathematics, what is that about? Is that Oh uh, yeah, Eugene Wigner's famous paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Physical Sciences. And yeah, I mean then that reminds me of one of your columns that you wrote about Larry Krauss's new book where he's figured out the one last objection to um, to having a completely materialistic world and now finally God is really dead all these decades after the famous Time magazine cover and Larry's figured it all out. He showed how you can get something from nothing. Yeah, and I was very, glad very... to see that it's that you had the same objections to this as I did when I first read about it and then read that, you know, real, really cutting review in the New York Times book review by David Alberts. Right. Who by the way, so Krauss dismissed him, dismissed Albert as a no nothing Philosopher. Yeah, right. And yeah. Uh, well, Albert, of course, way out. yeah, and Albert has a PhD in physics himself, and yeah. is a very distinguished uh, uh, theorist of quantum mechanics. That's his uh, his specialty. So he knows what <laughs> right. the fuck he's talking about. And, I know. And uh, the, you know, and he raised the really obvious question to um, to what uh, Krauss had had uh, offered as a kind of uh, uh, theory of uh, of creation. Krauss was saying that creation has something to do with these quantum effects, which can kind of spit particles up out of the uh, void. Yeah. So, so nothing, up. nothing was like a, not, nothing was like a zero-point energy field and something like that. And then this field, you know, through quantum mechanics, can produce something, you know, with uh, mass and energy, quantum mechanically. And this was supposed to be something out of nothing. Is that the yeah? Gist and, of it? and it's you know, it's I've heard this. Effect, you know, it's basically it's old stuff. It's, yeah, it, yeah. It's, I mean, it goes back. I remember hearing this uh, in the 1980s, and I'm sure it goes oh, yeah. back. And, and then there was a related that. thing with uh, with, uh, with with, with um, um, Hawking and uh, Hawking and uh, Jim. Uh, oh, why am I blinking his name? This other really good quantum. Yeah, Jim Hartle, Jim right. Hartle, the Hartle Hawking thing, where with the Big Bang, where how the Big Bang comes out out of nothing with the uh, uh, what was it called, the no no boundary theorem, the no boundary theorem, right? And with all this stuff, you know, all these bootstrapping kind of ideas, they still, in the case of Kraus, you know, what Krauss was talking about, which is, as you say, old stuff. It's um, you're, you're first you're, supre you're presupposing the existence of this thing called quantum field theory. Right. And I just happened to see this book on my desk. It's really beautiful on my shelf. It's really beautifully illustrated on the cover book called Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell by Anthony Z. Uh-huh. Who's this really great guy, physicist out at, uh, I think he's at UC Santa Barbara. So this, this is in a nutshell, quantum field theory. And... Uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'll flip through it upside down, and uh, yeah, here's a typical page, you know, with all these uh, uh, partial differential equations, and, and and this goes on and on, you know, page after page of this, you know, simple nutshell explanation of quantum field theory. The book is uh, 400 and you know, 500 pages long. <laughs> And you know all of this is like presupposed in uh, in supposedly getting something out of nothing. So where does all that stuff come from? Where does quantum field theory come from? And on a deeper level, where does mathematics itself come from? Right. I mean, it would have to be created along with the Big Bang. It's but the, it's the Big Bang usually way. talked about. So the mathematics pre-exists the Big Bang. It's turtles all the way down. There's turtles all the way down. Nope. <laughs> you know what I found fascinating about this book by Krauss is that it had a uh, a uh, I forget if it was uh, yeah an afterword by Richard Dawkins. Now I know Dawkins <laughs> has gotten very enamored of particle physics and cosmology lately because he's so desperate to find somebody that will just to find some idea that will just make the 
creationists shut up. And of course, they're not going to shut up. No. And, and the problem is that Dawkins, and you know, I think we were even talking about it at that Templeton uh, Fellowship back in uh, 2005. Dawkins uh, is just kind of trusting some of these uh, cosmological smarty pants like uh, Larry <laughs> Krauss. So in his afterward, he actually compares. He says that in the future we may look back on this book by Lawrence Krauss as the equivalent of Darwin's On the Origin of Species. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, God, exact, I groaned. And that's quoted on the jacket. Uh, here's his exact I, quote. If On oh. the Origin of Species was biology's deadliest, deadliest blow to super, supernaturalism, we may come to see a universe from nothing as the equivalent from cosmology. I mean... Oh my God! I was just, you know, Dawkins is so smart, but, but yeah, he's just become, you know, you have to recognize the limits of science in certain areas, yeah. or it discredits science if you say it can explain yeah. things even when clearly it's yeah. not explaining those things. Yeah, there are fundamental mysteries that you just, you know, beings in the universe cannot step outside the universe because there's nothing outside the universe see it from this whole godlike perspective and explain everything right and uh, you can explain huge amounts and you can say that this is all there is but there's nothing to keep you from you know believing that there's something outside of that that science can't prove and you know it doesn't get you anywhere as far as i can say so i'm not very sympathetic with that stuff and i'm pretty much a hardcore materialist agnostic and yet you know there's a limits to where what science cannot address and answer and then beyond that you know it's a free-for-all you can believe whatever you want to believe you know I mean where I have problems is why people decide that it's uh, Roman Catholicism Roman Catholicism instead of one of the varieties of Buddhism or Hopi religion I mean then to me it's all just kind of you know historical accidents and culture but it's this drive that people have to explain beyond what uh, our limited brains and bodies could explain. Yes. So you can't just say that, that you know everything is accounted for now. And yeah, you're right. It no, just undermines it's, science. It's a paradox that I, you know, I've been thinking of writing a column about this. Although I guess I've been kind of touching on it in various ways for a long time. It, there's this paradox I see in. in uh, in the physical sciences and especially in the physical sciences that have these really grand ambitions like particle physics and um, cosmology that um, you're getting these books like like uh, like this one by Krauss, books by Stephen Hawking, Brian Green that are saying we've explained everything. We don't need yeah. theology anymore. We don't even need uh, philosophy anymore. Um, yeah. Stephen Hawking and Krauss and some other physicists have been saying really nasty things about philosophers lately. And listen, some philosophers deserve it, but then there are other philosophers who are who are saying really yeah. smart, sensible things again about the limits of science. But what's weird is that the physical sciences is actually in a state of crisis right now. I think. right. And so right. I see this, and this is my spiel and a piece I just wrote for Scientific American that will sound all too familiar to people who, even if going back to my book, The End of Science, you've read stuff of mine, that um, physics is reaching its limits, and especially according to some of the benchmarks that it has set for itself. Uh, for example, the unified theory, and yeah. the idea of a theory that can almost explain itself, a theory that isn't arbitrary, just sort of here are the laws right. of nature. This, this is a good mathematical description, but a theory that also says why these laws should be this way and not In some no other, other way. way. A theory yeah. that reduces this terrible arbitrariness that we feel when we look at the universe and when we sort of ponder our our own yeah. existence. And yeah, and why is the proton slightly different in mass from the neutron? Yeah, and why, you know, why does gravity have uh, a force that was was just ideal for the formation of gravities and then solar systems mm. and planets like our own. And right. chemistry and seemed to also be strangely appropriate for the emergence of some kind of, of, of sentient creatures like us. So, and this, science doesn't have a clue how to answer those questions right now. 
And I think it's, prob it's probable, not just possible, that it never will answer those really yeah. cosmic questions. And, and I think a lot of scientists recognize this, and they're, they're sort of flailing around and, and uh, engaging in all this hubris and arrogance and, and claiming more than, than they're really capable of. That's my take, George. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, and, yeah, my, 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 my take on your take is that, uh, well, I mean, interesting, historically, of course, the whole drive, I mean, superstring theory, you know, when, um, when, you know, people like, you know, you know, John Schwartz and some of the original people first started talking about, about superstrings was just this really fringy, fringy thing. And then, through some mathematical ledger domain, it really looked like this could like converge on a single one theory, and that, and that would indeed explain why we have the universe like this and not like that, like why there are three families of, of, of particles, I mean, or three, three families of, uh, of leptons, mm -hmm. uh, you know, each associated with, uh, you know, three, three different um, uh, pairs of quarks, and, you know, why there are four fundamental forces, you know, and, you know why, why not other numbers, why the masses are all over the place, and, you know, why do we have two, two electrical charges, but uh, three color charges, you know, in quantum chromodynamics. This would all, it would just be necessary that it was this way or the universe couldn't exist. And, right. And then, yeah, and then there was this period in, um, in um, early 90s when, it had kind of it was really looking exciting because they had kind of narrowed it down to like was it five possible different superstring theories? And this it was, was called a, M, at M. one point it was a small number and now it was a small number and this and then that M theory was going to be the theory that united the five into one and that was really really exciting. I mean to me that would have been so elegant that even if they couldn't have um, come up with a way to test you know, physical consequences of the model, you know, the standard thing where it would take a particle accelerator the size of, uh, of the Milky Way or something to produce the energies to actually produce the particles predicted by the theories, the strings and then later the brains. But even so, if, if the mathematics had converged on just one possible superstring theory that, that uh, you could derive the standard model from, I mean, that would almost be enough to just say, this has got to be it. And then you could have philosophical discussions over what, it, what does it mean that we can't finally, you know, test it experimentally. But that would have been very, very convincing. You know, and then yes. time goes by, and the next time you look, we're up to, well, actually, there's 10 to the power of 500 or something possible super string theories. And, and the best way to think about this is that there's... Uh, 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 our universe is just one of 10 to the 500 different universes, and we can be represented as different peaks and valleys on this 10-dimensional space called the uh, landscape, and, uh, and we just happen to be down at this one, and maybe you can do statistical analyses to show why, why it's more likely for us to be in this little part of this this 10-dimensional hyperspace to be in one over here where we have a completely different universe. And then you can do anthropic hand-waving to say that it had to be this one because otherwise we wouldn't be here to think about it because there wouldn't be stars and we wouldn't have carbon chemistry and all of that. And, um, you know, you can do that. And I think it's great that, you know, I've said it before, I think it's wonderful that grown men and women are paid good money to do this. It's a, <laughs> a sign of civilization and it's an intellectual quest. But, yeah, it's just like frustrating as hell when you think of what, what, what the original aim was. Yeah, I, you know, I talked to Steven Weinberg, the great Nobel laureate, who actually is one of the people who helped to... Uh, come up with electroweak theory. Electroweak, yes. And the, Salam Weinberg. Yeah, and, and he's um, and uh, he's he's been gloomy about the future of uh, physics for a while. Um, yeah. But he was somebody who was saying that we needed to, to find the Higgs uh, quite a while ago, that it was an important step toward finding a, a unified theory. And he, the way he described the unified theory to me was that what he hoped uh, was that it would be 
um, so sort of beautifully designed that if you tinkered it all with one little tiny part of it, the whole thing would become logically inconsistent. So right. Like, there was one, only one possible perfect exactly. form for it. And, yeah. um, and, it's, and it really is almost literally the complete opposite of that right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, get to the point where it's making, um, you know, people talking about the, um, the landscape, uh, you know, you know, Leonard Susskind, we were talking about the, um, this idea of a landscape of, you know, huge numbers, if not infinite numbers of possible universes. I mean, they're basically redefining what the nature of science is. Right. And, um, and, um, and in, in the positive way to look at that is like, wow, we've been pushed to, to this whole new new uh, level now of how to think about the universe and then the other way to think about it is that you know we've seen that there's only a limit to how far our science can take us which has been you know pretty far although you know who are we to say you know stuck in the system and looking out well really far uh, yeah I mean really far you know by any earthly <laughs> yeah I mean Jesus yeah. we, we we still do have a pretty good picture of the yeah. origin of the universe, for Christ's sake. I mean, yeah, the Big Bang and the—it's all pretty amazing. It's, a, it's incredible yeah. that, that, that you know, the, you know, the, the, that we, you know, that these, we hairless apes could come up with this thing. But on the other hand, um, I, I I do think we're we're bumping up into what appear to be fundamental boundaries. Are right, and then you get into the realm of sociology, and you have to ask, where are the bright young people? going to um, study, I, you know, what fields yeah. are they going to pursue, and I, I, I just, I don't know, physics, particle physics especially, uh, um, to me, does not look like a field with a, a really, uh, a really uh, great future, and, uh, you know, as opposed to neuroscience, for example, which I think in yeah. spite of, uh, it's enormous, to, actually because of its uh, enormous complexity and all the difficulties it, that it poses for experiment, um, I think that's where the future uh, lies for really great breakthroughs in understanding ourselves. And, you know, a well, Bertrand yeah, Russell. So cell, cell biology is another one that I would I, I would put out there just because I'm becoming, you know, I've just been buried in cell biology now for two years writing this book about cancer. Oh, and, right. um, it's just. You know, just fascinating. But again, God, just you know, it's just the opposite of physics, where the aim, or, or maybe the aim is the same, but it's just the opposite. Where in physics you're rewarded for simplifying, and like there's a whole bunch of you know, little details, and then you can kind of take it and say, you know, wait, this can all be explained as different aspects of that. So the drive for unification, while you know, you get into cell biology in the cell, and um, you know, just the more you look, the more exceptions there are, and all consistent with the science. And and all the you know, for every mechanism, there's a little counter mechanism, and then it's like a and then it's like a, a, a ba homeostatic balance between one mechanism and the one that negates it. And and you just get variegated detail, and can spend like your whole career, you know, focusing on. Um, on, on the nuances of one little uh, intracellular pathway, like sending signals from receptors outside the cell down into the nucleus to the genome. And uh, I mean, people are going to continue to flock to that science and your neuroscience in huge numbers. And, what, George, and, what, we've talked about this before, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are now. And, uh, you know, there might be people out there who haven't heard us talk about this before, I don't remember, but what, you know, this, this, this increasing complexity that we're getting from biology, from cell biology, you know, I guess we're talking about uh, molecular genetics and things like that, um, is it, do people think that this will yield eventually to clarity? You know, so one of the analogies that I make would be to the situation in particle physics in the 1950s when you just had all these strange particles popping out of particle accelerators and nobody knew how to make sense right. of it all. And then, you know, Gell-Mann and the other guy nobody remembers anymore uh, came up with, um, with the idea of quarks and it suddenly imposed this order on what had been total... Uh, right. Chaos. 
Yeah, the peri like a periodic table of the elements. Yeah. The, the eightfold way. And yeah, so with cell, well, yeah, I mean, what I'm really getting into specifically is cancer biology of the cell. And, and, and a big, you know, the equivalent of a big unification with that came um, in 19, no, 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 in 2000, the year 2000. Um, yeah, 2000, when, uh, when Robert Weinberg and Douglas Hanahan wrote a paper called The Hallmarks of Cancer, mm -hmm. and they basically took this huge amount of um, information that you know, had been learned in the laboratories in the last decade about you know, how cancer works you know, with the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and all of these other mechanisms, and they came up with six characteristics that they argued you know, that was pointing towards six characteristics a cancer cell had to have in order to, you know, become cancerous through this uh, random, random process of um, evolution that a cancer cell goes through. And, I mean, that's probably kind of the closest thing. And then they anticipated in this paper that within 20 years that um, the, the science of cancer, the, the cancer cell would become um, as... As, as as predictable as as electronic circuits are now, really? that you would be able to you know, that the wiring diagram of the cell would be would be pretty much in place. And they did a ten year follow up on that, which actually came <laughs> it was actually came out in the eleventh year, um, yeah, last year called uh, uh, the hallmarks of cancer, the next generation, mm -hmm. alluding to alluding to. Um, the Star Trek stuff, and right. then they were saying they basically made a you know very strong case that their basic hallmarks were still there, but there were some emerging hallmarks that still needed to be considered. But you know, so there's a basic paradigm that's, that's still that's still in place, and but it's not you know it's never going to be like the standard model because right. you know anything to do with life and biology, there's always going to be quirky little things that can happen, you know, through some other you know, through something that's outside of the model, but is not inconsistent as an exception, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're made through trial and error and tinkering rather than through some right. logical engineering process. Yeah, bricolage. Yes, bricolage. <laughs> that's, that's one thing different. that's really struck me getting into this. Like, you remember... Um, and, you know, you're learning about, you know, the whole, you know, Watson and Crick and Francis Crick standard dogma where genetic information goes from uh, DNA to RNA to protein and, and just this whole nice uh, Lego-like picture of the, um, of the genome and, the, you know, the three nucleic, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, you, know, you know, the gene with all of its nucleic acids, you know, coding, uh, coding for, for a certain for a certain protein, which can act as a you know a signal or a scaffolding kind of thing, and then the whole thing where like three, um, like a triplet of uh, three amino acids uh, stands for one. Uh, I mean, three of three nucleic acids. The letters the A, T, C, and G in the um, genome stand for an amino acid, one of the twenty some building blocks of the proteins, and there these little adapters. So you have the three you know, the three uh, nucleic acids stick on here, and then this creates a shape, and the, and the amino acid protein block sticks on there, and then they're all snapped together by the, uh, in, you know, with the ribosomes. And, and you, you know, and all this is still true, but it's just, you know, so much more complicated now. So, like, you know, the gene doesn't just exist in a discrete place on the genome. You know, part of the gene's here, and then there's all this junk, and then some of it's over there, and some's over here, and the whole thing gets peeled off, and then the junk gets edited out, and then you get the, get the messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA can actually, you know, things can happen to, um, to change that before it's actually transcribed into protein, and and uh, and I was just reading about all this, and I was thinking, wow. I mean, for one thing, what, you know, what an elegant theory. But the exceptions, or not the exceptions, but the convolutions, just show you that this was not done by a great designer. This is right. not how the great designer would have done it. The great designer would have said, you know, well, 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 well here's the gene for cytosine. Here's the gene for for alanine, and they would be just, uh, you know, more like Lego blocks. And, yeah. Uh a lot of work left to do, and and listen, uh, I mean, if if the, if the understanding was uh, was really 
um, coalescing, we'd have better treatments for cancer, right? Yeah, and well, yeah, and they are. I mean, they understand. That's one thing that struck me is they understand an enormous amount about about the cancer cell, and um, and it, it, it's also true this hasn't really. I mean, it certainly hasn't come up with many really great cures. I mean, you know, like the standard chemotherapeutic re regime is still you know poison the whole body in such a way that the um, you know the cancer cells which are dividing more frequently will bear the brunt of the attack and be less able to repair themselves and then the, and then you hold off and let the healthy cells come out without letting the cancer you know regain too much of an edge and then figuring out the you know the um, sequences of chemo that will you know that will uh, give you the best effects but still you know like you know, if you get a, a stage 4 metastatic cancer of almost any kind the chance of you know, buying more than more than a few years of survival is extremely low, and then the whole tar talk now is you know the targeted therapies, and these go right to the cancer cells. So, like with uh, you know breast cancer, they found out that uh, I think 20% of all breast cancers um, have an overabundance of receptors on the cells called HER2 uh, receptors, and it's it's a human epidermal growth factor receptor type two. And so they come up with these drugs that will, uh, you know, monoclonal antibodies, and they will zip down and, and latch onto the HER2 receptors and shut them down so the cell's not getting the growth signals. Mm -hmm. and, then the new, and then in the newest version, they're trying to combine it with a drug that in addition will take along a little tiny depth charge of, of uh, chemo and deliver it directly to the cancer cell and to nowhere else. Yeah, but well, again, I, these things still have terrible side effects because normal cells also have HER2 receptors, so they're also going to to get hit and blocked. And it's just that they have fewer of them than a than a malignant breast cancer cell of a certain time. Listen, I remember writing about monoclonal antibodies when I was in journalism school, and uh, <laughs> yeah. in 1983, and they were explained as you know, this miraculous breakthrough that was just going yeah. to eliminate cancer. And the, right. the idea of them seemed, um, uh, you know, it, it just seemed like it, it couldn't fail. It, it seemed like it couldn't fail. It and just, in some it, cases, like uh, like with primary, you know, stage stage one and maybe stage two breast cancer, where, you know, stage one where it hasn't metastasized. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, then... Um, then Herceptin is the name, is the brand name of the of the drug that targets out these receptors, and this has really reduced the death rate for primary um, breast cancer. But when you get to metastatic cancer, you're like adding it on, and in all these cases, you're usually adding adding it on with the same, you know, really really devastating chemo's, you know, like cisplatin and doxorubicin, the things that really wipe out the whole body. Um, and, and, and these can, you know, they, they might add months or years for metastatic cancer and buy someone some more time, but still, you know, sickening side effects, e even in use. And so they're still moving past that. But, yeah. you know, other things like cancers, like, you know, blood cancers, they've had much more more luck with. And, and uh, cancers that seem to have involved fewer mutations to the cell, which seems to be true with some leukemias, I think. And... Um, and you know, like Gleevec is a targeted, um, a targeted um, drug for a certain kind of uh, leukemia, and it's been, you know, it's turned what used to be, you know, you know, fatal, you know, basically a death sentence diagnosis into one that, you know, you know, pe people basically can, you know, get, you know, they can live. You know, you not indefinitely, but you know what I mean. They, right. it, it, it comes as close as you could say to curing a cancer, and yet if you stop taking Gleevec, the cancer comes back. So right. it's like a chronic therapy that you have to take to to uh, hold it in bay. So held it at bay. So you know, like step by step, they're getting closer. But as with everything, it just it's taking so much time. Well, listen, it's you know, then at least they will be occupied. Um, and uh, you know that neuroscience, is, I'm sure, is uh, mm. far yeah. far behind uh, even where um, uh, cancer research is. Um, yeah. but George, I just wanted to point out we are at the hour mark. Wow! How do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I wanted to quickly say that I, you know, still find the super, I, I actually do still find the super string stuff and all the stuff about the Higgs and particle physics really, really fascinating because I want to see what happens and, and I really love the idea. There was a great quote from, I think it was Maria Spiripulu, um, I think in Dennis's story, or one of them, and where she was saying the best thing would be if now that we think we have a Higgs-like thing, that we find that it's not exactly like the Higgs predicted in the standard model, and that this will open up some whole new, new physics, you know, beyond the standard model, and maybe, you know, take things in a completely different direction. So, you know, there's always that possibility, and the direction could be away from, from having to posit the existence of of um, particles that are, you know, essentially untestable. That's so, right. They need to yeah. find something that wasn't predicted. Listen, the acceleration yeah. of the expansion of the universe is still, I think, the by far the most dramatic discovery that's emerged, certainly from the physical sciences in, I don't know, my whole lifetime. With uh, the dark energy and yeah. the acceleration of the expansion. Yeah, because it just opened up this whole thing. And now, yeah, so I think that's going to keep happening. And then, and, you know, and lots of people are still going to, you know, be drawn to this, you know, wonderful, wonderful quest. But whether it will be, you know, as, you know, these, you know, sciences, you know, the popularities tend to come in waves. And, you know, certainly a lot more money is going to be going into into uh, sciences that are involved with, with research into cancer and other degenerative diseases, especially those that are more likely to affect you when you're older, since you know, we have the whole, all the demographic influences. But, you know, it's just all fasc fascinating stuff. Yep. Yeah, lots left to do. Uh, these people yeah. who say that science is ending, they don't know what, what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, where did, yeah, where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I was going to say one more thing about about science ending, but uh, and th uh, this would be a way to test uh, test whether uh, it's, it's a test for the Higgs boson to see if this is really the Higgs boson uh -huh. that it has the right you know characteristics. Uh, so you remember Frank Tipler's book uh, Physics of Immortality? Yes. You know where he posits that the universe is built in such a way that um, we're converging towards this omega point. So, um, and, and, and basically, as we approach the omega point, uh, the influence of uh, the human brain over the universe becomes stronger and stronger. You know, as time goes by, we explore more of the universe. We set up outposts. We can then start shaping, you know, moving stars and matter around by, by our own human will, and that ultimately the whole thing. Uh, the expansion, part of the theory is the expansion of the universe at some point does come around and it starts converging again. And then as it starts converging, the density of information we've come w with increases. And it's just like this computer that's getting smarter and smarter and more dense with um, information. And you finally reach this omega point where it's like a computer so powerful that it contains all possible information including simulations of all possible beings who have ever lived or died, including all of our dead loved ones. And this is like what he means by the physics of immortality. Mm -hmm. And we'll all exist together in this omega point. Well, it turns out that for this to be true, apparently the Higgs boson has to have, um, have a certain, I think, specific mass, not just within a range and other parameters. So if it doesn't have this, it will disprove immortality. So... Another way of looking at it is, you know, obviously immortality is true because, you know, <laughs> people believe this. And then you can say, if you believe that there's immortality, then the Higgs, the Higgs boson has to have certain, certain constraints. <laughs> I don't think many people are going to buy that except, except Frank Tipler. Of course, you, you know, if there are 10 to 500 kind of universes out there, surely one of them could include both uh, this different Higgs boson and immortality. Yeah. That's true. So this, it could be taken as, uh, as further support for the landscape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. We can't, uh, we can't end on a more cosmic note than that. Yeah, I can't think of anything. So, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. We'll talk about tweeting some, some other time. I, know, I noticed you started tweeting, and I'm sort oh, of yeah, dis yeah, yeah. Well, I'm dis I'm disappointed in you, John. 
Uh, listen, uh, it, it's it's just part of being a professional writer these days, my friend. Oh and, God, I can't uh, do it. <laughs> I've actually gotten I didn't into sign it. Up for that. I, I'm uh, I've I've tried to uh, create my own innovation. Although actually, I think other people have done the same thing. I most of my tweets are in the form of twikus, tweeting haikus. Oh. And the only reason I do it that way is because otherwise tweeting just seems kind of pointless to me. So I have to. There has to be some, a little bit of resistance to putting these messages together. And, okay, uh, so yes, yeah, so you're creating some constraints for yourself. Yeah, it makes it just more fun. <laughs> well, I'll have to go back and look. But yeah, let's do a conversation sometime and discuss all this new stuff here. Because it's going to be hitting me soon. My book, I have a, I finished my manuscript. I'm down to doing, you know, nips and tucks and sending it to the publisher and jet and the... the September for publication next year, and and I know I'm gonna to have to start thinking about whether I'm shooting myself in the foot if I don't start, you know, inanely twittering like a like a little bird. Well, listen, George, as I, I not to, think not, I not that you're inanely you. twittering. I mean, if you're doing haiku, that's uh, you know. No, well, George, I know if you tweet, it's going to be elegant and uh, and beautiful and and fascinating. Um, and there are people who have, who have uh, gotten in contact with me who say, yeah, yeah, John Horgan tweeting, but can you get George to tweet? Hmm. So wow. uh, they're waiting for you, George. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sure. In the so, well, so how does this work? Now, are you, now, do you tweet this? the fact that we've done this, or, or have you been tweeting throughout? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> You're not that close bad. close to yeah. being that advanced. Uh, but I will probably tweet about this. I'll I'll do a twaiku on you and uh, on you and me. Oh, okay. And then I can. I have gotten to the point where when we do these things, I I post them on Facebook. Yeah, Facebook is so passe, man. Is that the sort of the same thing? But but tweeting is just more more widespread, or? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for journalists, it seems like tweeting. Listen, Bob Wright helped. He was one of the people who convinced me that I should tweet. Um, uh, he just said for journalists, it's it's actually a useful tool. I'm not convinced of that. Yeah, uh, it but, disappoints um, me like and Bob. I, I'm still kind of in the period where I think it's fun. Whether or not I keep going, I don't know. I might run out of gas eventually. <laughs> everybody, everybody in the Scientific American group started tweeting before me, and so I sort of felt like I needed to as well. Yeah. And they all tweet each other, you know? Ugh, That's yeah. how it works. I just feel like it just creates so much more noise that any single tweet is just, uh, you know, like just such a drop in the ocean that it can't make very much difference. But I don't know. George. I mean, there, I have to think there about is no it. Sing there is no signal anymore, George. It's all noise. Yeah. So get with the program. Yeah. God, I don't even have an e-reader. Well, um... <laughs> Yeah, let's do a whole thing on this. Okay, sounds how, good. How I went from going, yeah, well, part of the, one of the themes will be how I went from being, pride myself on being the cutting edge of the Internet for all these years, and now I seem to, you know, I'm let, letting it go behind me and becoming a Luddite. Yeah, I know, but you got to at least start tweeting before everybody gets sick of tweeting. I mean, because that would be really sad. Well, but I'm kind of waiting for that, and then I'll see what the next big thing is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it'll be something involving like flashing lights or something. <laughs> okay, John. <laughs> All right, man. On that been, note, it's been great. Uh, okay. Yeah, so whatever you want to do it again, you know where to find me. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Take it easy. Okay, bye.